Okay. Um, so hello and welcome um, to the question and answer chat that we've got um, organized um, with Erin Lafford after her wonderful talk uh, that you've hopefully all had a chance um, to uh, watch and, and think about um, before this evening. So what we're going to do in a moment is I'm going to reintroduce Erin um, and she's going to talk a little bit about her um, paper, so re reprise her paper a little bit. Uh, and then um, I'll lead with a question um, and then we'll sort of open to other people uh, uh, asking questions. And you can um, ask to ask your question yourself and I can, um, I can, uh, it says allow to talk. So maybe it's a little bit hierarchical with Zoom webinar oh or, Zoom. Um, or um, you can even be promoted to panelist and, and, and talk in person uh, as it were. Um, so people have started to use um, the uh, chat to say hello and um, have a chat, which is nice. Um, there's, a, so there's a button uh, along the bottom of your screen um, that says chat and you can sort of open that up and chat to us. There's also a button that says Q&A uh, and in that you can write um, questions uh, and we can um, we can sort of prepare and answer them. And it's, it's sort of easier to, again, in a less cluttered way, to have chat going on in the chat and questions going on um, in the Q&A. So if you want to just ask a question and not be bothered to write it out, you could just write Q um, in the in, in the Q&A and I'll know to sort of promote you. Um, uh, or you can um, write out the question and I'll ask it off Erin, um, if that makes sense. And, and you probably noticed that I clicked record. So this um, this whole thing is being um, recorded. On the chat, uh, this, is, I, this is what reminds me to say this, on the chat, make sure it's set to two panelists and attendees um, if you want to um, send a message to everybody. Uh, you can send a message to individual um, people, uh, but just a note, this all gets sent to me at the end. So be polite is what I suggest, or, or be rude in the full knowledge that I will see your rudeness afterwards. Um, <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Um, so yes, welcome to um, our sort of the final question and answer virtual seminar of the year. Erin um, reminded me just before I started recording that I should also advertise um, next year we're returning with some uh, Victorianism, mummies, aliens. It's going to be very exciting. Um, but now we're going to talk uh, to Erin about her wonderful paper on um, careless John Clare. So Erin, tell us tell us about that again, and then we'll do some questions and answers. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation. It's really lovely to be part of this series. Um, I have prepared just a short kind of recap of some parts of the paper that won't be very long at all, but I will just share um, one slide. Um, if I can just get that one. Here, so can, I, can you see that? Yeah, so, um, the paper, Careless John Clare, um, emerged really out of thinking about this sonnet by Clare, um, An Idle Hour, uh, which <laughs> is from the manuscript that he'd been putting together for his uh, proposed volume, The Midsummer Cushion. Um, so he's putting the manuscript for this together between sort of the mid-1820s and 1832. Um, and I'm not going to read it out again because I did read it out for the uh, pre-recorded paper, but I was struck um, as I said in the paper, by how the sonnet has been written in this register of a kind of careless leisurely ease um, and sort of uh, effective detachment um, with the speaker just kind of casually marking and noticing things kind of as and when they draw his attention. Um, but at the same time, the sonnet is then harnessing this mode of idle observation to um, work towards quite a morally and ethically charged um, conclusion. So this realization that um, in the world, some strive and fare but ill while others riot and have plenty still. Um, and he's seeing care as kind of as unevenly distributed as these mud drops that are kind of randomly uh, and very haphazardly uh, sort of splashing um, on these dehydrated uh, leaves. And so I thought that Claire's frequent adoption of a poetics of uh, carelessness um, so read as this form of sort of leisurely dispassionate observation um, or as a kind of wild disorder as well. Um, can I suggest be read as more than just his participation in either an aesthetic tradition of um, disinterest or a kind of showing the influence of kind of picturesque negligence on his work. 
Um, but it can also be read as Claire negotiating <clears throat> the limits of effective attachment. And I think um, shows a commitment that he has to the kinds of ethical commentary that a dispassionate um, disposition might be able to achieve. Um, Claire, um, as his kind of writing career went on, he became increasingly uncomfortable about what he considered the um, quote parade um, and kind of public petition of uh, his own distress and um, his sort of material difficulties, um, especially in the context of trying to gain sort of subscriptions and patronage uh, for his volumes and especially around the Midsummer Cushion. Um, and this frustration with sort of sentimental exhortations um, in relation to the circumstances of his own poverty, I thought is really interesting to consider alongside this careless disposition that a lot of his middle period poetry um, sh shows in the form of attention that Claire pays to non-human nature in particular. So as a lot of the debates in uh, what's becoming known as sort of effective eco-criticism, uh, they center around asking how literature and narrative might um, solicit or incite our kind of care for the environment um, for both sort of human and non-human. Um, I wanted to think about how Claire's interest in the poetics of carelessness could contribute to rethinking what this care might look like in the context of um, disinterest and dispassion. Um, so the really interesting work that's currently being done by um, the Care Collective as well, so this is scholars such as um, Andreas Chatterdarkis, uh, Jamie Hackim, Joe Littler, Catherine Rottenberg and Lynn Segal, um, they're suggesting that we're living in this current crisis of kind of carelessness and a systematic uh, organised neglect is how they state it. Um, and I don't want to force a parallel between um, this kind of carelessness as a sort of neoliberal condition and carelessness as an aesthetic and an effective mode in Claire's poetry. Um, but I do think that he uses an aesthetic register of careless disinterest that's available to him to make quite powerful observations about emotional and material um, inequality. Um, so as I suggested in the paper, uh, attending to the sort of the critical interest in the role of dispassion and sort of negated affects um, as much as in sort of sentimentality and sensibility in 18th and 19th century literature um, can uncover other alternative kind of literary registers of care than just sort of sympathy or pity. And so the idea of organised neglect um, speaks as much to Claire's alertness to the uneven distribution of care in his human and non-human communities um, as it does to his aesthetic interest in a careless ease or a kind of artless form of poetry to use uh, Mina Gorgi's uh, term. Uh, and so in, in, in a poem like An Idle Hour, we see him deliberately bringing these two facets of uh, carelessness together. So that's my sort of short summary over um, yeah, so I'd be very happy to answer any questions that people have or thoughts. Thank you. If like, should we un we keep sharing the screen or unshare the screen? Oh, sorry. Let me get rid of that. There. Mm. Ah. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was going to give you a round of applause again because uh, uh, it was a wonderful talk, and, and thank you for that, um, Pressy. I thought it, it was um, a really rich talk in that on those sort of tensions between sort of caring and carelessness. And I've prepared um, a, a question for you because after um, after I stopped recording um, your talk, we had a little chat about the Badger, which is a poem that um, I know students love in particular, and I think yeah. it's a really rich and interesting poem. And, and your talk sort of made me think about it so this this isn't just throwing you throwing the badger at you we 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 we, we laid the the groundwork just <laughs> off record as it were so how did i how did i phrase this i said uh, to what extent is claire's a uh, position of detachment or carelessness designed to invite or provoke sympathy for non-human nature in his readers for example in a poem like the badger yeah no i think it's a really good question it really made me go back to that poem and and think about what is going on um and i i thought that I could ask, answer that question in two ways, really, off the top of my head. And one is that um, I think that Claire's sort of affective detachment um, might come out of a frustration with or a dissatisfaction with um, the register of sentiment and sort of sentimental appeal um, 
appeals for care and for kind of notice of both sort of non-human and human. Um, so in his early poetry, especially in um, his first volume, Poems Descriptive of Rural Life and Scenery, um, there are works like a poem called The Robin and another poem on cruelty, um, which ventriloquize um, the suffering of kind of non-human animals um, in these very kind of dramatic, sentimental sort of appeals and pleas. Uh, and they're, they're not really poems that are thought of as particularly kind of clarion, for want of a better word, but like they don't, they don't offer us this kind of haphazard, sort of detached aesthetic of a, an observer who's kind of watching but isn't projecting themselves into the scene that, um, you know, Claire's kind of more known for or, or thought to be writing in this mode um, now. And it's not that I think there's a single reason for why Claire's register um, and style sort of develops the way that it does into this more detached aesthetic. But I do think it's interesting to read his growing frustrations with the way he doesn't want his own distress sort of paraded in front of patrons and, and other readers um, with, in relation to the, the poetic attention he then starts to show to sort of non-human animals. So he wants, I think he wants to find an alternative mode to sentimental appeals. Um, so he wants you to sort of notice and to care, but not to be forced to notice and, and care perhaps. Um, and so that mode of sort of just laying things out as they are or as they're happening, um, it's not about not caring, but about avoiding this kind of sentimental parade perhaps is how I think of it. Um, and so this kind of matter of fact tone um, in a poem like The Badger, it, it kind of in a way feels more affecting because there's the sense that the speaker is just kind of noticing and relaying what's happening rather than a sense that one might do anything about it. Um, and it might also be that sympathy isn't really what the poem is calling for perhaps as well. We could think about that, um, but maybe just attention and kind of noticing, not getting caught up in kind of effective dramas or displays of kind of pity, um, but sort of really seeing um, what's happening. And yeah, so that's one way that I thought about answering that question. But there's also, I think this sort of quiet admiration <laughs> for the badger as this kind of stoic animal in itself. So the, the animal itself seems to be, is shown to be fairly sort of careless in the way that it's sort of cackling in the face of <laughs> threat and um, destruction. And so, and one of the ways that care and carelessness kind of pop up continually in Claire's poetry is as this sort of freedom from human cares and human bird, effective burdens that Claire sees animals, sort of non-human animals and birds as kind of not having. So it's almost kind of an admiration for animal effective freedom and a kind of yearning for that freedom from care as well. So I wonder if there's also that admiration of sort of animal carelessness that's somehow at work in the poem, even though it's, it is very violent and, um, but yeah, the way that the badger is figured as, uh, Sort of always coming back for more and um, sort of it is sort of unburdened in lots of ways by sort of worries. Um, that's that's a, another thing that I thought in response to that question. So that's what I would say. But I do think it is about Claire trying to find different um, ways of writing care that aren't just about a sentimental appeal. Mm -hmm. I was thinking like that that idea that, that he he's sort of um, antagonistic towards parades of like his own sort of suffering and and then. Yeah. Um, is also sort of, I'm not sure if shielding is the right word, but sort of shielding animals from that kind of parade. Is it really interesting that it's yeah. something about, I don't know, like dignity or, or yes. respect. Although like, I was starting to think when you were talking about it, that dignity is another way, talking about animal dignity is another way of sentimentalizing. Yeah, um, no, I think one has to be, there's always, it's, the trappings of kind of anthropomorphism <laughs> are difficult, as I'm sure the students have been talking about if you've been thinking about animal studies um, uh, when you've been looking at Claire. But yeah, I think there is a sense of, of dignity or of, of yeah of, of noticing rather than pitying like attending to rather than yeah. if not dignity then kind of respect respecting autonomy isn't it that the, the, there's, yeah. sort of, there's, there's a sort of separateness mm -hmm. that that carelessness allows that 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 not caring allows the animal to remain separate yeah. so it's kind, I kind of, of liked the um the part in your lecture where you talked about like non-human acts of scavenging you know in a winter's day and that sense of the kindredness between Claire being um knowing hunger and the kind yeah. of animals knowing hunger but that act of carelessness is care I loved that thought that by kind of dropping a crumb carelessly you're 
really kind of giving care to an animal it's kind of like when you let a garden overgrow or something like that it's very much a act of carelessness that brings in a, about care I love yeah. that kind of mode of thinking I thought it was really interesting oh thank you yeah I just I, I love that passage from um Shepherd's Kanda a lot and it is that Claire writing at these other kinds of haphazard modes of care that feed into him wanting to write a poetic, a kind of negligent poetics that's sort of off the cuff, but also so interested in these networks of care that are happening um, on their own terms. And um, yeah, cause, because I think he has a lot of frustrations with, with systems of care, institutions of care, like sort of parish relief. He, he's trying, I, I sort of see him as writing alternative kind of ecologies of care in his poetry. So for a long time, uh, our only question was, can badgers be thrown over Zoom, which was hilarious. Um, Who asked that? We have, but we have proper questions now. Okay. Um, so uh, Simon has asked one and Min has asked one and Simon okay. got in first. Do you want to, Simon, would you like to ask it in person or would you like me to ask it? You haven't necessarily said. No, I can't even find you. That's the trouble. Oh, there we go. If you don't mind, I've like I've 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 upgraded. You. you can ask the question if you'd like. Yeah, I have, yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You. Brilliant Bye. paper, Erin. I've got to read my question now because I took ages uh, making it sound, uh, you know, eloquent. It was a magical paper, Erin. The question oh. reads. Thank you. The, the other form of care that appears in Claire, or, or is rather context of it, is is when he uses the word careworn and oh. he's he's lamenting being an adult. I think that happens enough for me to recognise it as a bit of a pattern or, or a, a motif that pops up. Mm -hmm. Do you think that carelessness can sometimes be aligned with Claire's um, admiration for the freedoms of childhood, which is, of course, a fairly staple romantic thing to do? Mm. Yeah, I think that when I was reading Claire for carelessness and how he might talk about it, one thing that jumped out was his sense of oddity and difference in um, relation to other children or the way that in his autobi autobiographical prose he's often writing about the fact that he felt different from other children and this feeds into his sense of his own very idiosyncratic care for and attentiveness towards things so he can't walk past kind of plants and things without noticing them and wanting to point them out to others and he's quite sort of bruised by the fact that other children are sort of careless of this um attentive impulse that he has but i think that you're you're definitely um right to suggest that there is a, a carefreeness um to childhood that claire also kind of laments and and elegizes the loss of um yeah and i, I think yeah. But then adulthood is marked by and scarred by being too caring, you know, care warm. Yeah. You have to care for other people and, you know, it's nicer not to have to bother. <laughs> yeah, and I think he feels his sort of family attachments in that way. As much as he writes about his love for his children and his family, he's also um, living with parents. What His father, Parker, is um, sort of disabled and, and suffering really badly from rheumatism, isn't he? And so there's a sense that he really feels his familial attachments as a kind of as burdensome and finds the act of care and provision for his family quite difficult as much as there's also a lot of expression of fatherly love and concern for um, his children. Um, yeah, but I, I will think more about how often care worn um, crops up as well. Thank you, it's brilliant. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And Min, would you like to ask your question or I could read out for you? Let's see if I can find you first. There we go. Hello. Or well, maybe not. I think if, oh, there you go. I've done it. There we are. Can you hear me? Hi. Lovely. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I loved your paper. Thank you. It was it was really interesting. I, I listened with, with great interest, getting my exercise when I'm in between marking today. I was tromping up and down listening. So it's really good. Okay. Thing. Um, uh, and it really made me think, and I really learned a lot about Claire, so that's lovely, because I'm slightly out of my time zone here. Um, but there, there, there's actually three things. I'm sorry, it's awful. It's three no, things. No. I you, but I, I don't, but to take, take it very steady. I suppose the first one um, is about how, what relationship you might think that this, um, this, this stance of Claire's, this kind of dispassionate, caring 
you know, that you desc described so interestingly. Is there any relationship to Enlightenment discourses of science? So this is the period, isn't it, where uh, scientific writing is becoming more and more objective. So um, I know that uh, I, I doubt that Claire uh, you know, studied scientific writing. I'm not sort of asking on that level, but in the sense of um, this is a new way of talking about nature, isn't it? Um, in a scientific way. Uh, so uh, what we would call a scientific way. So um, uh, do you think, uh, and there's something about the, the objective nature of what you're talking about, uh, uh, Claire's way of describing it, the, the objective careless way that he's describing it, and yet the way that he's noticing so much. Uh, so I'll shut up. Is that, do you think there's some kind of relationship with science here? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, that's really interesting. I think um, one thing that I mentioned in my paper was that other critics who have written really compellingly about dispassion or carelessness um, that I've been interested in. So David Carroll Simon's work, um, his book Light Without Heat, is thinking about um, sort of 17th century scientific observational modes and how dispassion is, is a... Um, uh, approach to one's so topic of observation that sort of allows for mental uh, sort of mental laxity as he calls it and a kind of yes. a more wandering kind of exploratory effective state that um yeah, isn't kind of uh, insisting on um or sort of rigid in, in its thinking and so yes. I found that a, a really inspiring text to to, to think with um, when we're thinking about kind of what modes like carelessness might offer to uh, literary inquiry but I think that what you're saying about Cl Claire's relationship to scientific observation how that might be dispassionate is interesting because he's such a complex poet to think about in term in relation to things like natural history and botany and that he on the one hand often offers himself as the poet who doesn't wish to kind of pin moths and butterflies to kind of cork boards but to observe them in their poetic manner so yes. in, their, in their kind of lively um uh, uh state um but as you say at the same time he has this a naturalist way of seeing and kind of being able to um kind of uh think about the components i suppose of his poems in the way that a naturalist might think about the comp all of the components of the kind of the animal or the vegetable oh, nice. looking at and so i hadn't been thinking about scientific inquiry in relation to claire but that's not just, but i think that that would be really fruitful because i Think that there is he does have a kind of naturalist's dispassion as much as a poet's kind of um care for or his po particular poetic care for the animals as kind of whole lives rather than as kind of taxonomic parts yes um, yeah oh lovely no that's really interesting yeah uh, yes no thank you very much for that and i you did mention the light without heat book and i was interested and i'm going to find it now so thank you for it's a great but it's a really good book i really recommend it yeah that's thank great. you <laughs> thank you so I think in um, the chat, Gerald Killingworth asked a question, um, which I'm going to uh, read out for um, ease because I think only the panelists could could see it. Okay. It says, um, do you think that Claire generally announces by means of his choice of key verb at the beginning of a poem the degree to which he's going to be engaged with the subject? In this poem, the key verb is lean, which suggests that he's not a relaxed observer and not someone who is going to involve himself closely with the scene depicted which might be about the poem that you showed us, An Idle Hour, or it might be about the badger. It just says this poem. But sort of, the, do you, does, does he announce by his verb choice his, um, his degree of engagement or his, his, his degree of carefulness, I suppose? That's interesting. I mean, a lot of people have picked up on, I think Jonathan Bate, I can't remember which text it's in. It might be his biography, or it might be in Song of the Earth, writes about how often Claire opens a poem with I love. So I love to see um, poems like kind of Emma Sells Heath in Winter, which is kind of suggesting, I suppose, uh, quite a strong kind of element of attachment to the scene. Um, so, but in this poem, Sauntering at Ease, I love to lean. Um, I suppose that, let me have a look at the question that's been asked. <laughs> it's about it, it's the, the sort of verb does does verb choice indicate degree of um engagement so it's a, i guess it's sort of that 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 sort of word level analysis of, of 
of a Clare poem? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose it could, yeah, sort of announcing oneself. Claire's poems are often so much about kind of in, uh, caught in the act of entering the scene that I suppose thinking of the verbs as kind of announcing the way this, the speaker or the subject might kind of work their way through that scene. Yes, I think that paying attention to the verbs would be a good way into that. So saying that you love leaning, I, to me, does indicate a sense of kind of leaning back and kind of watching, but also sauntering is the key verb there. It's somebody who's going to kind of want saunter at their will. They're not sort of striding through with with a kind of direct purpose or intent. That leisureliness again, that, that, that yeah. was key in some of the, the poetry that you, you analyse, that, that yeah. he, he's taking pleasure in not having an aim or not having a, mm -hmm. a purpose so much. Yeah, um, having lots of time, which I think is, he as a labouring class poet, he's kind of, you know, always writing in these snatches of time off. Um, but that's a really interesting question, um, Gerald. I don't think I've given a very good answer to it. I'll think about it a bit more. <laughs> Up. And we have another question that's okay to be read out. Um, I think you've already touched on this a bit, but are there any acts of care and carelessness that are specific to Claire? I'm thinking of Wordsworth's The World is Too Much With Us, Humanity is Too Much, and P.B. Shelley's poetic carelessness in his manuscripts. I was just wondering about the broader implications of carelessness in the Romantic period. Of course, class is a factor, and I know Claire is your main focus. Thank you. Smiley face. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, is there a sort of is there this sort of tension between caring and, and not caring or carelessness in the broader romantic period and particularly Wordsworth and Shelley was, were mentioned but sort of mm. is, it, is it a romantic trope or image or idea beyond Claire? Yeah I think so um I think so I, I was spending a bit of time with uh, the, the name of the critic eludes me I'm really sorry but the idea of the poetry of indifference um, and poets like Keats being um, central to that. And so I was interested in kind of putting Claire in this sort of counter tradition that's being seen as not a poetry of uh, strong emotion, but a poetry of sort of indifferent attitudes to strong emotions and what that might um, mean. But also um, to, thinking about care as specific to Claire, I was interested in his specific context in how they might affect how he might think about a more general kind of sense of care. I mean, care is more and more taking on this kind of double life as um, a, bur a, bur a burden of kind of worry and kind of being full of care and woe and this kind of um, like the act of care, I think, in, um, in this time period. And so I think that it's, it was the context of parish relief and the way in which these individual cares might intersect with kind of more systematic kind of structures of care. And that's what, how I was interested in, how I would and will be further interested in thinking about Claire and kind of carelessness is how, um, yeah, this kind of sense of individual sort of lyric um, care might interact with um, caring structures and sort of systematic um, ways of thinking about care. I don't, yeah, does that answer the, the question? <laughs> I think I, I, I was convinced. Yeah. And I was wondering if it was if if that um, if if Claire's sort of indifference or poetry of indifference was a sort of anti-Wordsworthian sort of thing that it, it, rather than rather than emphasising an overflow of emotion, it's it's sort of underplaying emotion. Mm, yeah, but I think Wordsworth is also trying to find a way uh, into um, how to sort of appeal to care. So the way that in which she writes about kind of impoverished figures and sort of the Cumberland beggar and people like that. I think there's also a sense of um, a poetry of sort of sentimental appeal, but that isn't just about sort of pleas for pity, but kind of um, showing us these, these figures kind of lives and talking about a kind of everyday habitual kind of encounter with them. Um, I saw someone in the chat remind me that the leaning in the the I, and I know it isn't a leaning back it's a leaning over the bridge and of course, I think yes sorry <laughs> I think that's <laughs> that would be correct <laughs> and, but Molly does say, Molly says that you your answer did answer her question so, so oh I, I think we 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 we've covered ourselves um there uh, and Mary has a question and I'll, I'll see I, and I'll see if she wants to be upgraded well I'll just I'll upgrade her and she can tell us not great too, as long as she remembers um, to unmute. Hello, Mary. I'm happy to be upgraded. Hi, Erin. <laughs> Hi, Mary. <laughs> That's great. I had loads of questions. I don't know why I settled on one on Keats, but here we are. So it okay. kind of follows on from the previous question. So 
I was wondering about carelessness as a kind of state of mind that enables you to do things um, and phrases like productive in, inattention, I think used in the paper like, like that, that state of mind. So then that made me think of negative capability. Yeah. But I think Claire's doing something very different. Like for Keats, it seems to be a, way, a mode of thinking to be sort of creative or to be philosophical. Whereas Claire, it seems perhaps more about observation. I mean, being creative as well, but like, so I was wondering about a sort of Keats inward, Claire outward um, mm. contrast, but, or maybe they are more similar than I thought, but yeah. I wonder what you thought. Yeah, well, I think um, that I really like your sense of Claire's kind of observations being one that looks outward because the way I saw it in a poem like An Idol Hour it's that the the careless kind of inattention is what al allows the moral kind of message of what Claire is observing to sort of come to the surface so um, thinking about Keats embracing kind of uh, he doesn't want that kind of irritable reaching after fact that he's talking about in um, terms of negative capability I think for Claire there is something that's there to be seen um, but he, I, in a way he's sort of trying to find a, a dispassionate way of arriving at it in a way that I feel like allows to, it's, it sort of sanctions him showing us this the kind of the, the inequity and the kind of um, the uneven distribution of, of care you know as a poet who's kind of perhaps politically anxious about writing kind of quote unquote sort of like angry or sort of distressed poetry so he says at the beginning of the parish that he knows he's written in um sort of distress and that um he's almost sort of like apologizing for his political outrage i think um in sonnets like an idle hour it's a way to kind of make these sort of political commentaries but through a kind of sanctioned register of sort of ease and carelessness um i don't know if that i don't know if that quite answers your question but that's how i, I see it's it more it? interesting than what i was asking <laughs> so that's good <laughs> nice that's really interesting I just don't know I haven't read enough Claire I need to go and read more but yeah it's, it's fantastic so thank you, thank you and not to say that Keats is a politically disinterested poet in any way as like Nick Rowe has shown as well but um yeah yeah I think it's I think it's different yeah thanks Mary thanks Mary uh, and we've got a question from Matt who I will discover yes um oh hi Matt Oh, can I can I be heard? Yes. Okay. Um, I've written this question, so I'll just waffle around it for a bit, and you can read the actual question, which is probably more concise. But I just wondered this. And this might be a larger question for um, about what to what extent this issue of care aligns with self consciously positioning oneself as an artist, and how that works across different chronological periods. So now we would think of artists as people who care differently, and I, I give the stereotype that artists are not supposed to care about money, problematically in some ways, um, but are expected to sort of see form or details or deep things more than other people. I'm wondering to what extent you see that being a play in the way that Claire's framing himself, because it certainly seems to be there in the Ashbury poems or some of the reception of Claire that you talked about, but I'm wondering to what extent that's live in the 1820s and 1830s. I'm thinking perhaps a little bit of work like Jane Darcy's book on autobiography and Julian North's book on the domestication of genius and David Higgins's work on the appearance of genius in early periodicals. It seems like this moment of Claire's positioning himself as care or being positioned as careless and careful is about the point where this is coming through. And I wondered whether he's in on that discourse or whether the people manipulating him or positioning him in on that discourse or how, how you've seen that playing out and what you've been looking at. Thank you, Matt. That's um, really, really helpful question um I'm going to try and answer it now but I'm also that's also something that I really need to go away and think about in a lot more detail but I do think that um Claire's writing in uh, a mode of carelessness is of course also self-conscious about kind of writing as a particular kind of poet so something that instantly came to mind when you were talking was how much Claire admires Byron as a poet who's kind of gives the impression of kind of um, like not caring whether his poetry is kind of bad poetry and that that kind of um, carelessness towards one's verse that is um, of a particular kind of class position I think but also of a particular like um, you know one who has poetic gifts would not would be kind of sort of negligent with them or, or um, kind of cover the effort that goes into kind of creating them and Byron kind of playing with this identity as a kind of careless poet and I think that Claire is is definitely interested in that. And he's so, in the quotations from his prose that I um, 
quoted where he's looking at people like Reynolds and Charles Lamb and sort of the genius of their wit that he sees as just kind of like rolling off the tongue in this totally sort of um, unpremeditated way. He's sort of fascinated and I think in a way sort of also quite intimidated by that. So I think he wants to be part of this sort of metropolitan, witty, kind of careless um, uh, playfulness. Um, I think that, that may not be relative to what you're saying about genius so much but I think in terms of how he, he's self-conscious about positioning himself as a as a poet who can um kind of play with and um be at it be on par with kind of these other kind of witty sort of geniuses that he that he ad admires um I think the carelessness definitely feeds into that um does that answer some of what you were asking yeah thanks. that's a really useful answer I think Byron is often the figure who ends up at the center of these sorts of debates often in opposition to Scott or Wordsworth. So I think yeah, it is really. Thank, no, thanks so much. It's a really helpful question. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Right. So um, Jamie has um, two questions and says, feel free to read out. Um, so as he's asked two, I will I, I will read them the, for him. So he um, talks about two questions about being uncared for, or brackets uncared for, rather than caring, uh, one of which is fairly predictable brackets from me, um, Jamie. Uh, the first one is, what do we make in this context of the fact that Claire spent a good part of his life in care or in the care of others in various ways? Pastoral care has a very different ring in the context of the workhouse and the, the asylum. So there's sort of, what do we make of Claire being in care? And then the less predictable question is about the natural world's indifference to us. Um, the little birds that in the bushes breed reminded me of Wordsworth's little hedgerow birds that peck along the road and regard us not. Um, is there an aesthetic of cosmic indifference in play um, in Claire's aesthetic? Wow. Um, I'll answer the first one first. Um, Jamie, can I just ask, do you mean by what do we make of Claire being in care in terms of how we read his kind of poetic commitment to registers of carelessness in relation to that? Or is it more a general sense of um can we think of how do we think of oh hi are you gonna are you going to I've, I've, hello i've got great hello. Asking can I be you heard? A, a clarification yeah, i was just i was just, just struggling to to try and find the right button to speak up um yes i mean just it, I, I, you'd, you'd already begun to answer that question i think in terms of parish care um, mm. and the way that um claire is sort of enmeshed in, in system in social systems social structures of care as, as yeah. you called them um, and so I just I just wondered about that that sort of that other connotation of care that that care uh, as cura is also power you know pastoral care is pastoral power that sort of Foucauldian sense of care uh, mm. which is something that, that obviously we kind of need to touch on with with Claire who who is sub uh, yeah su subjected so often to the, the the attentions and and cares of others um, um, in a way that that that, that yeah he's not entirely in control of that process of, of care and caring. Yeah, and I think that he, his poetry would be, speaks really well to kind of contemporary, like current debates in sort of care studies that are very sensitive to how the act of care and the act of, and the position of being in care is, can effectively be a very difficult one, like caring is really hard work and um, being in a, a, a position of requiring care can be a very difficult one to accept, and so I think that Claire writes of his kind of unhappiness in the asylum in a sense of feeling sort of restricted and away from his family and away from sort of um, locations that he's very attached to. But I think he also offers us a chance to think about ways in which care is a difficult thing to receive either. Um, but at the same time as he also writes about sort of feeling abandoned and sort of un, without care in the asylum. So it's a, the asylum is a really interesting context to think about all of these quite um, difficult and um, sort of conflicting emotional experiences around um, a state of care. Yeah, um, it's, it's that fundamental paradox of being in someone's care whilst feeling completely uncared for. Which yes. That is famously in the in the sonnet, none know or care. Yeah. Um, and yet you are completely subject to the care of others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the paradox that I suppose I'm interested in, in here. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a really lovely question. That's, and um, I'm sure that we could have a really good chat about that because yeah. of your work as well. Um, 
in terms of your other question, could you just repeat? So thinking about cosmic indifference. It's just about the, the, the world not caring at all about us. You know, ah, you did, okay. touch, you did touch upon that kind of sense yes. of freedom that comes with uh, I care for nobody, nobody cares for me. Yes. This is the Miller of D, uh, mm. often quoted in the period, has it. Um, and that sort of indifference also has that harder edge of, of, of the natural world being unconscious of it, us. And you know, not being capable of giving us any care or regard, um, the animal world particularly. Um, the, we look at it, but you know, when it looks back at us, it might not care about us. <laughs> um, and that sort of indifference is a is a possibly a bleaker sort of indifference or carelessness um, that the natural world presents to us. Um, but it's also, in some ways, quite comforting because it's not the directed attention of scrutiny that, that Claire obviously feels quite subjected to. So is there a sort of hopefulness almost in, in the fact that uh, sort of none of it matters, I suppose? Is the, is it... Yeah, I, I suppose. Do, I mean, you ever get there? I mean, it's it's not a mood. It's not I'm not I, it's not something that I'd recognise particularly in in Claire's writing. I, I can't think of any examples, but I just wondered if, if you could think, think of it. Yeah, no, I'm struggling to think of examples. A, a poem like to the smite to the snipe smite snipe is coming to mind, not because I think that he's got there in the sense that you're thinking of as it's a kind of hopeful sense, but um, of kind of looking at this bird and longing for, I suppose, um, the secure sort of um indifference it's been able to find and, and i suppose the peace it's been able to find in sort of dwelling in these kind of inhospitable marshes away from um mm. kind of uh, the care and sort of notice of 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 um humans sort of intruders um but i i'm not sure yeah, the, the productivity of neglect i thought that was a really interesting part of your discussion and neglect which is so often a a pejorative word that even in terms of authors we talk a lot about neglected top neglected topics neglected yeah. authors and neglect yeah. is something product productive i thought that was a really interesting line of of thought and inquiry yeah that he seems fascinated by place what happens when places are left alone or what could have happened had places been left alone um but especially in poems like the snipe the snipe is thriving because it it, it is in undrained um land um so uh yeah Thank you for all of your thoughts. They're, they're really helpful. I really enjoyed the paper. Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, well, thanks, Jamie. So um, Cassie has a question um, that that she says in brackets at the end, ill-formed, happy to clarify, but feel free to read out. I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump to asking her to to ask her question if she's ready to. Yes. Fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, this is one of those selfish thinking about my own research questions. And I've been thinking a lot in a kind of about genre along gender lines, which I haven't really done in relation to poetry. But I think the concepts here in this kind of discussion of what's being maybe described as more passive kind of attention um, could in fact be quite, quite resistant. I think that's kind of coming out some of the discussion. And I was thinking about this in terms of um, the kind of growing encyclopedism across the 18th century into the 19th century that aligns with what Min was saying about um, kind of scientific knowledge and classification and Claire just sort of not doing that. Um, just it reminded me a little bit of the other kinds of formal things that particularly um, women writers or women artists are doing in terms of collage, scrapbooking, miscellany. So um, as I say it's not it's, it's kind of an off, off the cuff thought because I just went, aha, this is to do with what I think about and in a, you know, may not be at all helpful to you, in, but I'd love to know what you think about it in relation to Claire's poetry because it's coming from a very different place, I think. You mean the idea of sort of collecting fragments together and not forcing them to sort of speak to each other? Yeah, and, and the thing, so when it's, in terms of kind of collage or miscellaneous or scrapbooking, it's seen as in some, somehow in tension with creativity. So if Claire isn't imposing, um, if his attention is a, one that is less kind of impositional, I think that has some interesting implications in terms of creativity. And obviously it links to ideas of kind of things like negative capability. But if you look at it from the kind of angle that I'm coming from, which is um, alternative forms of kind of intellectual participation that don't fit in traditional, I suppose, masculinized categories, um, which to some extent, you know, Claire is, sometimes things maybe not being totally within in the poetic world then maybe it gives another perspective on um are there some dangers to adopting that kind of negative capability um whilst also trying to claim a creative authority mm. um, or is there a potential there i guess well i think uh, it's, oh, 
sorry. So it's a really, no, it's a really, really fascinating what you're saying. Um, I think that I felt like Claire was finding on some level a poetic freedom in declaring his work to be inconsequential in that way where like if you someone who claims to not you know that they really care all you need is someone to tell you that they don't care about their work right for you to know <laughs> that they really care about it but that this there's a freedom in kind of claiming that your work is merely a trifle or he often describes his his work as kind of scraps or as kind of these fugitive pieces that means yeah. that He's, it's, it's an element of sort of self-protection as a, I think a sort of labouring class poet in a literary marketplace so he's sort of sending it off to his publishers and being like I don't really care what you think of it or if you don't if you don't like it like you can tell me I won't be disappointed because it doesn't matter and I don't care about it and, and they're, they're merely trifles anyway and the amount of times that he prefaces his own work with the fact that it's it's just a trifle or a kind of fugitive piece is really yeah. fascinating but as you say that the double edge of that is I think there is a sense of he's anxious always about this sort of self-fashioning of himself as a poet, a neglected poet, or um, kind of what it means to him to be, uh, as he calls it, like a stray cattle in the field of the muses as this kind of labouring class poet, poet, poetry. So it, it is a kind of deliberate disempowering of his own position, but in a way that he finds, I think just helps him to write and to mm. produce. Is that, does that speak to it? What yeah, and I think it's sort of, I mean, in terms of what I'm thinking about at the moment, the way in which um, women, women do that, of course, uh, women like, so we're working on Piazzi where she'll claim authority through the anecdote that's been, anecdote that's been told to her by um, an eminent male friend or an author or a member of the House of Lords. And, and that's kind of, it's observation, but she, it's assemblage. But then I suppose with Claire, it's also, his authority is coming direct from nature, isn't it? So there's a kind of power in, again, that kind of negative capability and being able to receive those messages clearly that, mm. um, but I just, I mean, I'm not, I don't know how much that that's really adding to your thinking, but for me, it's, it's just coming from um, a slightly different approach to what I've been doing. I find really useful and, and really interesting. So thank you. Um, but yeah, no, totally answer my question. I just hope I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally amazing. Amazing. I know I'm, I'm just I would glaring, be... glaring at the blank screen where I would be now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, that, that's really interesting. Thank you, Cassie. Um, that your work sounds, sounds really, really wonderful. I'll probably do it well, too, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Cassie. Okay, so I'm going to um, skip over um, Min because she's already asked a question, but we might be able to come back to you if we have time and go to um, Dora's question that she says to be read. Um, uh, I'm not an academic, so this question may be something you've covered already and I will not be aware. I'm sure it's fine. Um, can you give us a different word for care and carelessness and how this contributed to Claire's breakdown and how he coped with this? So there's sort of, I guess, a question about the linking into um, Jamie's question about sort of being in care, I, I guess a sort of a, a question about sort of how those questions about care and carelessness link to his um, sort of mental health and um, incarceration because of it. Yeah, well, um, another way in which the term careless pops up a lot in Claire's letters in particular is how he defines the state he's in when um, he's having an episode of illness or of his kind of indisposition as he called it so um, I, I'm not going to be able to quote um, precisely because I don't have it in front of me but he talks about how he's like he's been very ill lately and kind of careless or he feels completely careless um, and so it, 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 and writes about his apathy and so it does have this kind slightly kind of pathological edge for him as well as being in a state of feeling I suppose sort of dejected or kind of too ill to care or a kind of a very effective burden of kind of sluggishness and not feeling kind of um, energized enough to to care for others or to care about what he's doing and so in terms of it, it carelessness as a state that feeds into his mental and physical disorder it is there as this it, it, it's there's a kind of the buoyancy of being carefree but then there's also this kind of very heavy kind of effective feeling of being sort of too sluggish to care so it has this kind of heaviness and this lightness at the same time in, in this sort of paradoxical way um that's what immediately comes to mind thank you um we've got 
a uh, couple of questions um, from people who've already asked questions. Jamie okay. is, is on to his third question now. Great, okay. I'm, I'm also aware that like just before we started recording, uh, you, you did say that this you th this felt a little bit like your Viva. And I didn't yeah, want- Yeah, it totally to, uh, does. <laughs> and, it, it, and, it, and it also, we've also, uh, you've answered at least eight questions. And I think I asked one on top of that. And I think Emma asked one uh, on top of that. So we, we, we've properly grilled you um, this evening, but, like maybe maybe you I'll, I'll give you free choice of answering either Min's or Jamie's. Min asks about uh, the relationship of Claire stands to the aristocratic mode of sprezzatura, um, and um, Jamie asks uh, about urbanity and coolness in relation to Lamb, uh, with Carlos um, looking like maybe a pun on Charles, and also uh, a near anagram of Claire. Uh, and, and how it links to sort of Lamb's imperfect sympathies and um, those sort of sharper modes of disinterestedness in romantic theory often expressed in prose rather than poetry. So mm. Claire and aristocracy or um, Claire and urbanity, pick. Um, I confess I'm not familiar with the term that Min used, so I don't want to, to ramble in a kind of a moronic way about <laughs> in a way that in a word about a term I've pretended to understand I'm sorry Min um but uh Jamie I think that yeah there is this real the urbanity of carelessness as this kind of as I was saying earlier this sort of metropolitan wit um I think that Claire is totally sort of enamored by these figures when he goes to London I think that there's a lot of stuff been written about how he's sort of alienated by uh, uh, London, um, but also uh, uh, as people like Simon Kabeshi have said, he was really kind of a clubbable poet as well and really wanted to participate. And so there's a sense that he admires this kind of, um, yeah, sort of cool, uh, sort of um, like uncaring sort of attitude to one's subject, the, the sort of the dabbler. Um, and I think as much as he's sort of very invested in his own sort of poetic styles and, and, and sort of aesthetic modes, I think he does kind of admire um, urbanity. And I think David Stewart's been written some really interesting stuff about Claire's prose in particular. I don't think enough work has really been done on Claire's prose. So I think there's a lot of it in manuscript that needs looking at in terms of if there's a, if there's a different way of writing about carelessness in his prose to his, his poetry, that would be really interesting to, to think about. I really loved the um, those those portraits of Reynolds and Lamb that made me think about my own project about ridiculousness. And I'm, I'm oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting, getting ready to think about Charles Lamb with um, the the my next table talk, not the one at the, in December, but the one that will happen next year with Felicity James, and we're going to be talking about Charles and Mary Lamb and, and that image of oh, him fantastic. sliding off his um, chair in your in your talk was 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 wonderful. That that kind of different kind of carelessness that Charles Lamb. Yeah, had. Yeah. I love the way that he describes him as sort of being like a riverbank, I think, where the water, like, the conversations are sort of lapping at him and he's sort of resistant to it. It's very funny. Fantastic. Well, I, I think um, I'll, I'll give you another round of applause because I think you 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 withstood like a, a barrage of questions that were really... No, it's a delight. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry if... Um, I hope I answered them all sufficiently and thank you so much. I've got a lot to think about, so... You got, you, you got some exclamations in the chat that sounded sort of positive and... Um, okay. Thank you. And reassuring. Um, I know that um, I think Laura has some some advertising to do of um, of, of next terms um, talk. So do you, do you want to jump in, Laura? I will. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen if it will let me. If I can get to grips with. Can everyone see that? Yes, yeah. we can. Aha. So yeah, I'm, I just wanted to quickly introduce our upcoming talks for after Christmas, do a couple of save the dates. So on the 10th of February, um, Will Tattersall is coming to talk to us about Mars in the magazine. So he has promised lots of fun stuff about popular representations of Mars and how they're drawing on scientific discoveries about the red planet. And he has promised us some contemporary references to Star Trek and how this is sort of filtered through into modern pop culture today. And then on the 10th of March, a month later, um, Ellie Dobson of uh, Birmingham also is coming to talk about uh, performing Egyptian magic. So if you know Ellie's work, she does loads of fantastic stuff on the, uh, the, the idea of Egyptian mania in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So she's gonna talk about um, kind of Victorian interest in ancient Egypt and in ancient Egyptian concepts of the afterlife and magic and how these things kind of cross over in Victorian pop culture 
as special effects and seances and all the rest of it. So two dates and we hope to see you there. Yeah, stay tuned. Ooh. Yes, I, I will now. Me. There we go. And um, yeah, thank you for all of your um, kind comments to um, Erin and uh, us, but particularly Erin, I think. I think you did a, um, you so much. a, a, a great job fielding a, a lot of um, great questions. Jamie, it is still possible to see Kian's uh, talk and we should really put them on um, we should really put them on the website, which people keep ask keep asking me, and it keep reminding me to do it, and I've, I've I've not done it yet. But we will put it up on the website. But I can email you a a, a copy, um, um, straight away. Um, did I miss anything else while we were talking? People were just saying thanks and uh, bye. I don't think there's any more questions. Thank you very much. I think we will stop recording at this point. Um, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you in the new year. Um, have a Merry Christmas. And if you're interested in my gubbins, uh, I'm doing a table talk with um, the wonderful uh, Liz Edwards and five fantastic um, postgraduate students and early career scholars on December the 16th. But I did not prepare a poster um, for this, but the, all the details uh, on my Twitter. Thank you very much.